There are a lot of misconceptions and myths about dissociative identity disorder. As I sit back and watch the Letitia Stout trial, I've been getting a lot of comments on my page about this diagnosis. So let's dive deeper and talk about what is dissociation. We'll also talk a little bit about window of tolerance, the difference between DID and personality disorders, my thoughts on Letitia Stout's case, dissociative disorders, myths about DID, treatment for dissociation, specifically talking about EMDR and internal family systems. Now, this is going to be a lot of information. So if you want to skip ahead to a specific chapter, feel free or stay along for the whole ride. I'm Dr. Barry, licensed psychologist, and here I create educational videos on a variety of topics. I also like talking about things within media or court cases from a psychological perspective. Please know anytime you see a video from me, it's either going to be educational or possibly just to make you laugh too, because we can't always be serious all the time. Before we dive into dissociative identity disorder, let's first talk about what is dissociation. So dissociation is a way the mind copes with too much stress. It's commonly experienced by people who have been through traumatic events. And then also if someone is under a lot of stress, they might kind of disconnect a little. And dissociation has an impact on memory, consciousness, identity, and perception. When someone experiences dissociation, they often feel detached from reality or as though they're disconnected or in a dreamlike state. I've sometimes had clients talk about feeling as though they were observing from a distance. They were watching themselves go through something or they were watching something happening, but they didn't feel as though they were in control or they didn't feel as though they were in their body. I have seen clients dissociate in session, and we often use grounding techniques to help bring them back into their bodies and back into the moment. I'm also very careful because if you are experienced dissociation or anything like that, or have experienced a lot of significant trauma, often doing this work with a licensed professional is incredibly important. This isn't the type of work that you want to do on your own because sometimes the dissociation is sometimes covering some deeper experiences or some deeper emotions. And if we take away from that, if we try to bring ourselves out of it on our own without help, tools, skills, and support, that can sometimes make things worse for an individual. So there's a wide range of what dissociation can look like from very mild to very severe and debilitating. Some people may experience dissociation as a temporary escape from reality, while other people may struggle with chronic dissociation that affects their daily lives. Some common symptoms of dissociation include feeling disconnected from one's body or surroundings, experiencing a loss of time or memory, feeling as though one is watching oneself from outside their body. That's that example I gave of somebody feeling like they're over in the corner and experiencing a sense of detachment or feeling separate from reality. One common form of dissociation is depersonalization, which is the feeling of being disconnected from oneself or one's body. People experiencing depersonalization may feel as though they're watching themselves from outside of their body or as though their body is not their own. This can be a very frightening and distressing experience that can lead to a lot of confusion and even feeling disoriented. Another form of dissociation is derealization, which is the feeling of being disconnected from one's surroundings. So depersonalization, feeling disconnected from oneself, derealization, feeling disconnected from surroundings. People that experience this may feel as though their surroundings are unreal or distorted and may have difficulty distinguishing between reality and fantasy. This can be very disorienting and make it difficult for people to navigate their environment and do normal everyday activities. Dissociation can also take the form of dissociative amnesia, which is the inability to remember important personal information or traumatic events. This type of dissociation can be a protective mechanism as it lets the person cope with what they've been through while also temporarily blocking some of the specifics. But 
even if my mind doesn't remember exactly what happened, my body does. And there's a book, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And it's a very triggering book. So um, I have some other trauma book or recommendations for people that maybe aren't quite as triggering as that one. But it basically says that when we go through a negative life event, even if I might not consciously remember some of the things that my body does. And that's where I have clients that talk about in their mind, they feel they're fine and as though something isn't bothering them, but then they have all of these physical symptoms. They have all of these things happening within their body where the trauma can sometimes manifest in some somatic symptoms or possibly even with legit medical concerns. And that's where we talk about the adverse childhood experiences study or scale. And what this study showed is that individuals who had experienced a lot of significant adverse life events in childhood, that they were more likely to not only have some behavioral concerns, some mental health concerns, but they were also at a higher risk for medical conditions as well. All of these things are incredibly treatable, and I will talk about those things a little bit later. I really want people to be careful because some level of dissociation can be normal. If someone experiences a medical surgery and maybe wakes up during part of it, they might dissociate for parts of it and not remember certain aspects. And that's a way for their brain to help them survive this traumatic experience. And so really what makes something a diagnosis within the DSM-5, within that diagnostic statistical manual, is when it starts to interfere with somebody's functioning. And with ADHD, so there can be a disconnection that happens with ADHD that is more just the frontal, the prefrontal cortex. So sometimes just being easily distracted by other things, daydreaming, but it isn't because the stress is so high that I disconnect. That would be a form of dissociation. So let's talk about how trauma, the things that we go to, can affect our window of tolerance. So window of tolerance is the ability of stress that I can tolerate without being overly aroused, anxious, angry, out of control, overwhelmed, or under aroused. And that's feeling spacey, zoned out, numb, frozen. And that's where dissociation would fall, that hypo arousal. And the hyper is the volcano going off. The hypo is feeling that feeling of disconnection. And chronic stress and trauma can shrink that window of tolerance, where if somebody just goes through thing after thing after thing, it doesn't take as many things to trigger either hyper or hypo arousal. And this is the brain trying to automatically protect this person. But if we add skills, if we add supportive people, there are protective factors that can help increase our window of tolerance where we can increase what a person can handle without becoming overwhelmed or dysregulated. And I'm not saying an unsafe situation, because if somebody is unsafe, I want them to get safe. But I've worked with people that within their marriage, that in the midst of conflict, they the amount of conflict that they could take, it was very, very small. It didn't take much to either be hyper aroused or hypo aroused. And we had to within difficult conversations because of a history of maybe having unsafe relationships within this now safe relationship, they were struggling to have difficult conversations. And so helping provide clients with tools to make stress in their life more manageable is incredibly important. And what works for one person is going to be very different from somebody else. We talked earlier, I mentioned briefly grounding techniques. And one that I learned over on TikTok, but it works, is ice. That ice in your hand, ice to the back of the neck, or putting if, if somebody is feeling disconnected, if they're having trouble reconnecting with their body, because what's happened is our autonomic or our automatic nervous system has taken over and we are now in survival mode. But if I am currently safe, then I want to be in my thinking brain. I don't want to be in that survival, emotional, amygdala spot. I want to be able to be in my body and in this situation. And so also things that increase mindfulness, 
focusing on what is versus what ifs, which anxiety normally does a lot of what if this, what if that, that finding safe ways to be in the body that that can help people. We can often learn things in session that can help people be able to implement those same skills at home. And I'm really big on what works one day is not going to work the next day. <laughs> so if ice worked for me on Monday, on Tuesday, I might have to use music. And so really grounding yourself using your senses. That amygdala, that primitive part of our brain, sometimes they call it our reptilian brain, it does not respond to words. It's really, really sensitive to the surroundings and it can easily be triggered by a smell, by a sound, by a face. And being able to bring yourself back can be incredibly important. And it's really empowering teaching clients how to do that for themselves. So we talked about grounding, mindfulness, and then also dialectical behavior therapy skills. There are skills called distress tolerance skills, a whole section just on increasing our ability to tolerate stress. Dr. Marsha Linehan is the one that developed DBT therapy, and there are DBT therapists, people that do the full DBT program with individual therapy in groups, and then some therapists teach the skills. The most important thing when looking for a therapist is making sure that you connect with the individual. The specific treatment, as long as they are qualified to work with your condition. So if somebody is getting treatment for dissociative experiences, making sure that you're seeing a trauma specialist. And I will have some links in the description with some tips and tools for people to use when they're looking for a trauma specialist. So please know on my page, there are no dumb questions. So I love it when people ask questions because sometimes things that I think, oh, everybody knows this. No, everybody doesn't know this. And so I got a great question about dissociative identity disorder and borderline personality disorder. What's the difference? And the first place to start is the fact that dissociative identity disorder is in the dissociative disorders and borderline personality disorder is a personality disorder, which is a completely separate part of our diagnostic system. That a personality disorder, it is also a disruption in somebody's identity, but it's that sense of self, but not in their identity and who they, they are like their name, <laughs> because dissociative identity disorder, this is an individual that has multiple personalities. And when I say personalities, because sometimes because of our language that we use where it's like, oh, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm a whole other person, but I'm still Patrice. So I'm not a completely separate person that I have all the memories of every of everything versus dissociative identity disorder is this literal split in the person and there are all these different alters and each different personality is often formed as a way to protect the host to protect the main the main self that it didn't happen to me it happened to this person that that's often how these little fragments start so when we talk about Letitia Stout I do not believe that she has dissociative identity disorder um, because that's what her lawyers have said that she was diagnosed with. I cannot wait to hear the expert talk about this because she was evaluated when she came to the prison by Dr. Christine Moy Moyer. She is testifying today as I'm doing this video now, and I'm going to be covering that testimony in a separate video along with the other psychological experts because these things really intrigue me. I'm a bit of a psychology nerd, and yes, these things, the law and psychology coming together like this, I like it. But she evaluated Letitia when she came to the prison, and all she saw was some anxiety. And if somebody has a significant mental health condition, like dissociative identity disorder, over a period of time, you are going to see the other alters. You're going to see other things come up. Now, I think once the body was found, it would be interesting to see at what point, because I think it was in November, she decided to plead in GRI, not guilty by reason of insanity, because from everything I've heard so far, I'm mostly hearing 
cluster B type personality traits. I have not met with her. I can't diagnose her. I can't say what she does or does not have. Based on just what I've seen, I'm mostly seeing her protect herself, focus on herself. She's claiming a history of childhood trauma, which might be true, but an individual with dissociative identity disorder, their family would know. Everybody would be very aware of it. I used to work in a psychiatric hospital and we sometimes would see cases of severe dissociation and we would have to monitor for, is this person starting to develop significant issues or concerns? Anyone I've ever met that does meet criteria for dissociative identity disorder, they always have histories of hospitalization because individuals with this diagnosis are at a greater risk to themselves than they are to anybody else. And I'm going to cover that a little bit more in the myth section too. And even today, they're talking about forensic versus clinical, that within the forensic setting, they really are looking at is this person saying this to get out of trouble? <laughs> but within the clinical setting, I am looking at, okay, this person is referred to services. This person is coming in for help. And I'm just going to look at those two different settings because often people in outpatient settings, there's not this secondary gain from a particular diagnosis or being seen in a particular way. And it's just really sad because a lot of the things that Letitia is doing, it feeds into a lot of stigma that people have about mental health. So I've already admitted to being a psych nerd. So the information that I'm sharing about dissociative disorders are found on psychiatry.org. And I will link this in my description. But the three different types of dissociative disorders are dissociative identity disorder, depersonalization or derealization disorder, and dissociative amnesia. And breaking down DID a little bit more, so some of the symptoms can include the existence of two or more distinct identities or personality traits. These distinct identities are accompanied by changes in behavior, memory, and thinking. And it's really clear that this is a separate person. And there are often gaps in memory about difficult things that happen within the day or past trauma and events. And this identity or disturbance can't be a part of a broadly accepted cultural or religious practice. Somebody asked me if the social identity disorder was real and was it really a religious thing? And individuals with this diagnosis, they do respond to treatment. They do find resources and help and support with medication and with different options and things like that. And so that is where if it's truly a spiritual thing, medication, those things would not help. And I'm really big on breaking stigma within religious groups and mental health because there was a time where religious affiliation was sometimes a protective factor against certain diagnoses and things. But now people are, even with religious beliefs and experiences, are still having significant concerns that need attention of a licensed person. It's not something to just pray away. And in talking about some of the considerations and concerns, it's really important to note that individuals with DID, that they are at most risk of harming themselves, that possibly damaging property, but that these individuals are at a high risk to, to harm themselves. And that's why being able to do risk assessments. So if an individual does have DID, the therapist is often making sure to safety plan with each alter. And they have to manage it in a very careful way because high levels of stress can sometimes cause the individual to really struggle. So when we talk about dissociative identity disorder, let's talk about some of the myths. And it affects about 1% to maybe 2% of the population. And I've seen it the most with individuals that grew up within severe cults that had a lot of ritualistic type abuse. That's where I saw it beginning in like infancy, beginning very, very young. That's where, that's where I've seen it. 
Um, I do not personally work with individuals with DID. During my training, I was able to interview someone as part of a class assignment. We were able to talk with an individual that did have DID. I believe we talked with about five or six of their alters. And the individual had been in treatment for about 20 years. And that's where when people are like, I don't, is that, is it real? Yes, it is. And I will always make sure that I monitor my comments and things. People can feel free to disagree, but make sure to do it respectfully because I am just very careful because I know I have people that follow me that that do have certain diagnoses and I just want to be careful about how we have conversations like this. And so another misconception about DID is that individuals with this disorder, that they're trying to get attention. And this is a severe trauma and stress related disorder. It's not something that somebody would just fake for attention who actually has the diagnosis. Now, sometimes people do things for like likes and clicks on social media. And so I have I'll withhold any comments about, about that. I do know that there are people that do have this diagnosis that do create content. And then there are other people where people have questioned whether people are doing it just to kind of get attention. What I'm saying is when people have this in their everyday life and they're not content creators around it, that they're not doing this just for attention. And so what often happens, so what happens within DID is these fragments within the personality have happened due to severe, often ritualistic type trauma. And when traumas happen later in life, that's where someone might be more likely to just have dissociation. And I forgot to mention earlier that somebody can dissociate and not meet criteria for any of the dissociative disorders, that it is a feature of PTSD, that it can be a part of the other trauma and stressor related disorders. And that's where I say there's a range. And somebody can dissociate one time during an event and then never have like ongoing dissociation. And so um, sometimes our brain just wants to help us survive a difficult situation. I always ask people to be compassionate with themselves with how they survived um, a difficult experience. So once again, this is from psychiatry.org that with appropriate treatment, many people are successful in addressing the major symptoms of DID and improving their ability to function and live productive, fulfilling lives. And they talk about psychotherapy often being a big part of treatment. And I wanted to mention two other types of treatment that aren't listed on here that I typically refer for if somebody does present with dissociative identity disorder and they're looking for services. The first is called Internal Family Systems, and Dr. Schwartz wrote the book, No Bad Parts. And within his model, he talks about how we all have these parts of ourselves and that DID is a extreme form of compartmentalization, of detachment and dissociation, but that we all have these separate parts of our identity. And there is a great image that I will show here that talks about those different parts. That within a burdened internal system, that the self is the deepest essence or center of that person. And when differentiated, self energy acts as wise, compassionate leader, able to tend to and heal the system. Then there are these managers, the primary parts that act keep the person feeling secure by controlling people, events, and other parts. They bear huge burdens of responsibility for keeping life together and fear the relinquishing of control could lead to worse outcomes. Common manager behaviors and traits include controlling, analyzing, criticizing, judging, caretaking, pessimism, planning, and numbing. Then there are these exiles, and those exile parts can be sensitivity, anger, dependency, innocence, spontaneity, and openness. And these parts have been rejected or traumatized, holding deep wounds and memories filled with terror, pain, and shame. Young and childlike, often frozen in time and hiding for protection. They become increasingly desperate to share their story. 
Now for the firefighter part. So common firefighter behaviors and traits include using substances, um, binging on food. So a lot of those negative uh, dissociating, distraction, engaging in a lot of um, just concerning or safety related behavior. And their goal is just to save the exile from, from any pain, but it's in a way that self, that compassionate, caring, connected, creative, confident, it's not coming from that part. It's more just let's make the pain go away as quickly as possible. Firefighters can overpower managers' efforts to control the system when all else fails. Now let's talk about EMDR. And this is on emdr.com, and I will also link it below. But eye movement desensitization and reprocessing is a psychotherapy that enables people to heal from the symptoms and emotional distress as a result of disturbing life experiences. This is often what you hear because the goal is to reprocess the negative life events because what happens is when something happens, it ends up getting doesn't get stored and filed away properly like a traditional memory. So I had a breakfast bar for breakfast and that is filed away in my mind neatly. Now, if when I was eating my breakfast, if something major had happened that was extremely stressful, my brain wouldn't have taken the time to file that memory away properly. And so that's why often with trauma memories, they can be they can pop up and get triggered easily because they're they're just kind of scattered often in the more emotional parts of our brain, because those types of events typically trigger our emotions. And what we remember is a lot of the sight smells. And what EMDR seeks to do is to help reprocess those memories in a way where you can talk about it without overwhelming your system. And what they do is they use bilateral stimulation. And that just means using both parts of our brain. And sometimes like the therapist might have a ball where you literally just move the ball from one hand to another. I don't do EMDR. That is on the list of things that I want to get trained in, but I have been trained in a few of the techniques. And so there is one I learned on TikTok and also in a follow-up training called the butterfly hug, where you interlock your thumbs and just pat from one side to the other as you just... And that that can just be incredibly grounding and calming. And for some reason, just going from that left, right, left, right, that that can often help calm our brains. And even just doing a ball from one hand to the other, or some therapists will use their finger or a light that you follow as you're kind of going through some things. And during an initial session, the therapist is going to determine, is the client at a is the client at a place where they're ready to process the trauma? Because you don't want to reopen those wounds if the person doesn't have the skills to manage it. Because often reopening those wounds, reopening those doors, somebody might be reasonably okay in session, but then there's like the stuff that happens after. And therapy hangover. Sometimes you can have this rise in negative feelings right after therapy, right after you've gotten into some really deep stuff. So I make sure that my clients have the skills and tools they need for after so that they can be able to hopefully navigate things in a safe way. And so this site goes into a little bit deeper to the eight phases of EMDR and the treatment description. And so I, like I said, I will put that link below. And if you want me to talk more about it, please let me know and we can definitely do that. I'm really excited to hear what the experts have said today because we are now to the psychology experts part of the Letitia Stout trial and uh, we will see what the jury thinks. I think they've done a really good job for the state saying that she is or should be responsible for her behavior and that she was not criminally insane, that, that her pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, that was a way to avoid behavior and it's not an actual reflection of her state of mind during everything. And so we'll see what the jury thinks. We will see what the defense expert has to say. I am very intrigued because I would have thought that the defense expert would have done some collateral information 
it will be very interesting to see the cross examination of the defense experts. So they are likely going to play any part of the tape that seems to go along with her not being in her right mind. I think they're going to focus on that evidence. And like I said, we'll just have to see. If you have questions, let me know. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.